Hello, I'm Nan Simonson, and if you've listened to any of my podcasts, you know that I am a health and lifestyle coach. You know that I am the author of Aging Powerfully, that Powerfully is an acronym for 10 lifestyle modalities. I'm a health coach with a lifestyle medical practice, and I work with patients as well as my own clients, and I'm interested in all aspects of health. I talk a lot about the food because I believe that has a huge impact on the way we live our life in terms of health as well as wellness and therefore longevity. My goal is to go on, although I'm almost 72, into the next one, two to three decades. We'll see how that goes. The only way I can do that is by taking care of myself in a number of ways, including and besides food. So I came upon this podcast. I love learning every day. I spend an hour to an hour and a half or more um, listening to people that I find fascinating. And if you haven't heard me speak of him before, uh, it's somebody you may want to look for. I'm going to include a link to the podcast that got me started on this um, this morning, actually yesterday, and I've, I've gone back and listened again. It's a relatively short one for him. I'm speaking of Dr. Andrew Huberman. He is a professor of neurobiology and ophthalmology. Ophthalmology, neurobiology, how are they related? Well, as he says, the eyes are part of the brain. They're the part of the brain that get outside sensory and send it back in. And an important part of that is their circadian rhythm. And they're very tuned to light, light and dark, and how it affects our body's natural clock. And so the eyes are necessary for that. He is um, a tenured professor at Stanford, has his own lab there, and he is so generous with his time that he does several podcasts. He's very active uh, a week. He's very active on social media, and he is brilliant. He has more than 1,320,000 subscribers <laughs> to his podcast. And they are additional, I mean, they are, they are brainiacs like him, but there are also people like me who can take what he says, because that's his point. I want to put it in a way that lay people can understand, and he'll sometimes during the podcast get some rather specific words going, and he says, you don't have to know this, but I'm saying this for the, the um, aficionados or the, uh, the scholars in the group. So the podcast I was listening to was Learn Faster. It was a deep dive into how we learn. And at my age, there are a number of things I want to learn that I'm quite um, taken aback by, including technology. When I wrote my book, I began writing it in July of 2020, and it was published in December, the end of December of 2020. And the very next day, I began um, spreading myself out in social media without really having any idea what I was doing. And I had mentors and I had trainers and all of that. And it's been a, it's been a struggle. I think if you've heard me speak or read my book, you do know that I am not only dyslexic, but have ADHD. That was actually tested for and found in my 50s because I was in college again for a certification program as a, um, a uh, landscape designer, which I did for 15 years commercially and five years before that. No, actually 10 years before that uh, on my own creating a botanic garden. And um, I learned that, and it explained a lot um, that I can fall back on. Oh, that's just my brain. But then I wonder how often I use it that way. Ah, that's just my brain. <laughs> and I can do what Dr. Huberman recommends we not do. And I'll 
talk to you about that when we get to that part. So let's talk about what he is saying here. This podcast, as I said, is a, well, I don't know if I said that, is an hour, it was about an hour and a half, and that's, yeah, I did, uh, somewhat short for him. I've, I've heard some podcasts go on two and three hours, and I don't care. I'll go through them the way I would if I were at a college class because I'm listening to a college professor and I will revel in every word he says. So he's teaching something that I hadn't heard and maybe you haven't either and that's why I'm just going to put this out there, a lay person having gotten it from an expert. I'll use a lot of his words because I take very good notes. And I'll give it to you the way I understand it. And then, if you want, you can listen and ga gather even more. Because I am only giving you part, actually the first half, of something that he's describing. And then he goes on to describe it in, in other ways. And it's technical. And I just left that alone. That's when body and balance and, and movement and physiology come in. And what I'm going to talk to you today about is actually enough. Okay, here's the story. I'm going to first give you a little bit of um, his neuroscience as I read this to you. The brain and nervous system controls our behavior. People will ask, well, does my brain control my behavior? Your brain and nervous system control your behavior, but unlike other species, we as humans can change our nervous system. There's no such thing as muscle memory. He says, let me dissuade you from believing that, oh, our muscles just move because, through muscle memory. He said, there is no such thing as muscle memory. He said, it's the neurons in the muscles that store information for repetitive action, like walking patterns, breathing in and out. Um, and there's, a low, there's upper neurons and lower neurons. The, lo the lower neurons pretty much control the involuntary and repetitious things like the breathing and the blinking. The upper motor neurons up at the top of the head uh, reside in the upper part of the brain and they're involved with sending, sending signals for deliberate action which is what we're working with here. We're working with the part of the brain that is, is creating as it goes like making your morning coffee. It's almost automatic, but um, there are things that we can learn that we want to get up there. Um, and our efforts are to put them into practice and put them into place sooner or later. What's important about this is that if you're trying to change action, it helps to know which of these, the upper or the lower motor neurons are involved and what is most pliable. This is about plasticity. This is what we're talking about today. Um, neuroplasticity means a, a new, new um, uh, learning processes in the brain. It means whether or not we can, neuroplasticity fades and fails in those with dementia, Alzheimer, etc. Um, and we want to keep our brains capable of new learning until we are no longer on this planet. How can this be leveraged to access change to our motor experience and our, um, our, uh, our neural system and create new habits? All right, first we'll ask the question, can behavior change the brain? Yeah, we know that our brain can change behavior, but can behavior change the brain? Yes provided that the new behavior is different enough than behavior that we already know how to perform well. So this isn't, and he'll talk about this, the flow state uh, kind of um, information because flow state represents information with things that we have already conquered and that we are simply going with. This is something that we're trying to get our brain to react to and therefore to um, uh, respond to. As it relates to neural plasticity, the important thing is that the goal is to be selective about adaptive changes uh, in the brain, those that will serve us well overall. So what are the behaviors that you can engage in to adapt neuroplasticity 
to the behaviors that you want to engage in and perform well, they're the things, quite often, that cause us the most frustration. This is where things get interesting. The way to engage changes in neuroplasticity, that is to access neuroplasticity, that is to access learning, is to send a message to the brain that something isn't right, that something is off, that something needs to be changed. This creates a resulting cascade of neurochemicals and everything you hear from Dr. Huberman is science-based. He teaches based on information that is not only peer-reviewed but also um, rock-solid in science. Um, and his lab does a lot of the research that comes up with this information that then has to be vetted before he would ever get it out there to his students at Stanford. Um, let me go back to where I was. Um, this creates resulting cascade of, well, let me repeat myself, the brain um, has to, uh, what, what the goal is, is for the brain to send a message or that for us to send a message to the brain that something isn't right, something is off, something needs to change. This creates resulting cascades of neurochemicals, and we'll talk about what they are specifically, um, because something isn't where it needs to be and something needs to be modified. This creates error signals. Something is wrong, something is different, something isn't being achieved, and our body through our brain, through our neurotransmitters, will actually set out to make that right. Dr. Huberman made a point to say that, as I said, the flow state isn't what we're looking at here. That's not a state for optimal learning because it's already something that our body, our brain, feels that it has learned. So it's not going to get excited enough, so to speak, to put these actions into play. The point here is that we need something that signals neuroreceptors that something isn't right and needs to change. Making errors over and over again, meaning over or under reaching, getting it wrong, over and over again is the root, the route route, for shaking our nervous system up well enough again and again that eventually it starts shaping error messages that eventually start shaping the way we um, are able to input the information and then solidify it. Errors are the basis, and this is this, the whole premise here. Errors, and errors mean um, if you're playing the piano, there's an error if you don't get the key rights. If you're trying to learn a language, the error is, I can't remember how to say, what did you say? Uh, if I am on the computer <laughs> trying to learn things that go wrong. Oh, I had the worst thing happen. It's not the worst. I did a video, a cooking video and I got all the ingredients out, laid it out, everything's presented well so it can be put together very quickly. It was about a 20 minute video, all this food made. <laughs> and when I played it back, and this was on my iPhone using video, never had this happen before, and a uh, Wi-Fi clicker to turn it on. When I played it back, it was this 20 minute video played in 26 seconds, no sound have no idea what happened. Uh, I'm going to learn. And, and I heard this and I thought, okay, I'm going to learn these things. I'm going to figure this out because I do what he told us not to do and you'll hear what I'm going to say about that. Okay. Um, errors are the basis of the release of neuromodulators that lead to learning. This releases chemicals every time you fail a task or experience. The chemicals are neurotransmitters, norepinephrine, acetylcholine, and um, dopamine. Then there's a series of steps in the brain that seeks to fix what isn't right in that it opens up those hatches that then allow us to perform at something heretofore 
out of our reach. As stated, this cocktail of chemicals include norepinephrine, and that signals alertness, acetylcholine, that signals uh, focus, as opposed to, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I, this is too much for me, and, and quitting. It allows us to, I'll say, sit long enough to focus on it, that's the acetylcholine, and then dopamine, the reward and pursuit, and this is important about dopamine. Indeed, it is a reward chemical, but it is also a chemical that persuades us to seek out more of that. That's where we get in trouble with addictive behavior. Ooh, this feels so good. Ooh, I want more of it, and it's the neurochemicals telling us that, uh, but that's another story. Um, and again, the dopamine, the reward, and the pursuit is what allows us uh, allows for the changes to happen very quickly because um, our brain also seeks the effects of dopamine. We don't simply enjoy it emotionally and wants to repeat that again and again. There are, um, these are released in the brain to change something in the circuitry that later, and this is another thing I didn't know, that later, in, I, I've heard people say, Oh, sleep on it, you know, just sleep on that and you'll get it. Or, or when he slept on it, uh, put his mind to it at night, it, it basically in, in our sleep, uh, he came back with the answers. But this is neurologically accurate. Um, I'm going to read that back. These are released, these neurochemicals are released after having been secreted due to a, a, a challenge in any number of, of, um, of attempted, uh, acquired bits of knowledge that are secreted, go into our brain, and later in sleep help cement the change and allow it to occur. occur. Um, why would our nervous system ever change unless there was something to be afraid of, something that makes us feel awful, or that is an error that needs to be fixed. Those three will get our brain to change, and that error message in the case of our neuroplasticity uh, is what, in this case, um, will allow us to learn things and allow us to have the, the assistance of our brain in doing it in ways we never would have expected. It's the feedback of these errors that creates the positive impact in our brain. Up to the age 25, there's a lot of chemicals flying around in our brain and we learn from experience, thought, and action very quickly and very easily. Um, this learning happens fast. The time period after that is referred to the adult brain and it's much slower. And as Dr. Huberman was discussing all of this, in between all of this, he was giving, he was citing studies, he was referring to other neuroscientists and their experiments and how they found certain things to be true. It's really interesting. The signal that generates neural or that uh, generates plasticity is the making of errors reaching and failing. The message of the nervous system that says this isn't working, therefore shifts would be valuable and therefore um, start to take place. The neurotransmitters, again norepinephrine, acetylcholine, and then most importantly dopamine during these activities is where we get the mechanisms of shift that we're looking for. It's the errors that cause the nervous system, in his words, to start to freak out and say to itself that we better change something. It's the feedback in these errors that we're looking for. The point here is that we want to keep down the frustration. And again, this is these are the lessons right here in this sentence. We want to keep down the frustration level. Simply keep trying. Don't fight it. Go with what's happening and know that you're shifting your perceptions and your responses by the effort of simply staying with the task. 
a lot of that takes place at night, that final um, incorporation of that knowledge. Thus the importance of always attempting to get a good night's sleep. All of this happens quickly in young babies and in older brains. It happens slowly. This is very important to remember and to embrace. Take what would be that overriding, damaging frustration and leverage it to digging in even deeper and then you're leveraging the neuroplasticity with the help of those neurochemicals. On the other hand, if you take that frustration and then walk away from the endeavor, you're setting yourself up, and that's me. I, I, I've, I've spent, especially with the difficulties in school due to dyslexia, the ADHD, you know, there's a shiny object over there, there goes my mind. Um, it, 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 and, and, and a number of us do this as we get older. We just, it's a little bit harder to take in new things and it becomes easier to say, I'm too old or, or, or just to walk away, to let that not be something we deal with. And, and, um, uh, the mechanics of phones and computers and IT can be that thing that maybe a, a number of you can identify with, I can. Um, so take, I'll repeat it, take what would be that overriding damaging frustration and leverage it, digging in even deeper, then, then you're leveraging the neuroplasticity. On the other hand, if you take that frustration, walk away from the endeavor, you're setting yourself up for that repeated scenario, scenario and the ensuing negative emotions in its aftermath. Uh, there is fundamental and foundation, or this is fundamental and foundational to our, our ability to continue to build neuroplasticity. The effort then, or, or the effort, then the stewing frustration should be seen as a signal to calmly dig in a little bit deeper. And then the understanding that this will percolate in our brain, especially at night during sleep, and then repeat and rinse, repeat and rinse. So what have we learned? You take on a task. Oh, there's some details. I'll get to that in a minute. You take on a task. You feel the frustration of it being difficult actually the learning takes place in those periods of it being so frustrating that it's taking our attention uh, all of our determination to stay with the task it's that place where you just dig in a little deeper stay calm understand that you are getting it not at that moment and that there are chemicals that have been stirred up from this action, this behavior, that will then work on our brains later on and cement these activities into place. Isn't that interesting? To clarify, we're looking at and talking about smaller bits of information with short bouts of learning. In other words, stacking them up, clicking them off one by one, not dramatic shifts in behavior. We're capable of learning huge amounts of information, but again, in smaller segments and in smaller increments. He talked about not taking a huge, complex, very involved situation and trying to learn it all. Our brain doesn't know what to focus on in that case. He emphasizes, I think I'm going to repeat myself, he emphasizes not to pack in a lot of transformational goals rather than more specific action goals. He said that the brain will not know what to focus on. Um, he clearly pointed, um, uh, oh, uh, be clear as to the direction, the very specific activity that you want to learn. 
again, this pertains to um, uh, tasks that we don't already know because we won't get that neural transmission um, buildup from that. This is, these are new things that we want to learn. These are things that take um, a, a level of concentration that can then build up error messages that can then let our brains do their thing and use our neurotransmitters the way that they can to help us learn, the way kids do easily every day that they're in school or every day that they're moving through life, but it changes a lot as we get older. Um, oh, it's best not to keep adding a variety of errors. That's where it gets confusing. He actually pointed to a time frame of 7 to 30 minutes in order to inspire plasticity. On the other hand, they found that if there was a crucial imperative, such as hunger or survival, the brain, even the older brain, is, is um, remarkably adept at plasticity. The key word here is extreme necessity and survival. How badly we need and prefer that plasticity will determine how much and how quickly plasticity will occur. In other words, how important this is to us and how urgent can set the rate for how quickly we'll learn. I see this actually with patients. As I work with patients in the health field, one of the hardest things to do is change the way we live, change something that we're so used to that it becomes our not only natural pattern, but our, um, our reality. And in lifestyle medicine, we our goal is to help people get off medications, get away from procedures, and just live a healthier life to make them well. And we will get people who are so sick that other doctors tell them, this is the end, there's nothing more we can do for you. And we can get them off diabetic medicine, we can get them off of blood pressure medicine, we can save a leg, and this has actually happened, that was about to be excised because of a infection that nobody else could stop and yet changing the lifestyle and especially the food getting out all the inflammatory foods made all the difference and saved a leg and um, when people come to us that way I'm thinking of this gentleman I'm referring to the neuroplasticity was instant he figured out he and his wife both figured out how they were going to live from that moment forward, eating whole food, plant-based, get the oil, salt, and sugar out of there, get away from the processed foods, get away from the animal foods and animal fats and saturated fat and the, the high insulin-like growth factor that comes with animal proteins. He went overnight, and within three months you could see the difference not only was the leg still there, but the difference as if this had never happened. We see this all the time. Um, that's my example of what neuroplasticity looks like when there's an imperative. And yet, I have had people say to me, this is what I want, I want it so badly, I've wanted it for years, and still can't get beyond the morning you know, pastry and, and coffee. Um, the imperative isn't there, it's not great enough, or they just haven't decided they really want to do it. And it comes down to that as well. You've got to want to. If you write something down that can give you an imperative that might send you on a journey of learning in a specific field, it would be that phrase, you've got to want to. And then if you want to, <laughs> there's an imperative. And then if there's an imperative, we dig in. And again, that's where if we want it really badly, there can be frustration and that helps get those neurotransmitters behind your actions to help you make it happen. In this video, he talks about something called the Altrian uh, um, cycle, Altrian cycle, 90 minute rhythmic cycle. That's part of our circadian clock. It gets deeper than that and I'm not going to go into that, but you can watch the video yourself. Um, 
but he talks in that about the best learning time and a synopsis of this is that during a period as i was saying before of seven to thirty minutes um, in a seven to thirty minute learning bout directing our learning effort and and concentration and that during a learning session when we get to the point where we're making errors during that session when we're making errors we're getting we're missing the mark we're missing the cues that's where the frustration begins and that's the point where we are most apt to learn so again don't fear the frustration don't stop then dig in gently dig in um, not too long but long enough to get you through several uh, I'll call it iterations of what it is that you want to learn um, learning to attach the dopamine process to making errors because that's part of where the the um, reserve is uh, I, it's this is no fun I don't want to do that and this is what Dr. Huberman, Huberman said you can subjectively associate the experience of frustration with something good and and we can I mean think of something you've done that was difficult that was I'll call it emotionally painful um, in the past and think of a good outcome from that and if we keep that outcome attached to that difficult thing we can feel a dopamine surge from things that would otherwise be appalling if we've decided that there was value there if there was a high there if there was something that we got out of it um, you can subjectively associate that experience of frustration with something good that experience of striving and frustration and then the the dopamine hit at the end and then the accomplishment highs making the failures uh, or making failures or or living the failures but associating them with get good outcomes will get dopamine involved um, and you've controlled that uh, can you tell yourself something and have it affect dopamine absolutely Dopamine is highly subjective and what you believe and what you embrace and what's in your thoughts can affect it. In other words, it's released based on what we subjectively feel is good for us. So make lots of errors. Tell yourself that those errors are actually ultimately good for yourself. Keep the bouts of learning relatively short if you're an adult and revel in the process. I don't know if you got from this what I... I know I did, and that is some simple uh, directives about my capacity, our capacity as humans at any age to continue to learn, and that learning can take place when we think that we're at the worst place we can be, a reason to even stop that's where the learning happens. Isn't that fascinating? I think that's terrific. <laughs> and I hope you do too. I hope this was helpful. I'm going to attach the link to his full talk. And um, I thank you for joining me. And I hope you're going to have a great day. Remember to subscribe to my channel and give it a thumbs up and all those things. Everyone says it and it does make a difference. And um, have a great day because I know I'm going to. And, oh, thanks, Dr. Huberman. Bye-bye. <laughs>